part two of three for reading log 20. Chapter 32, the end. There wasn't time to run. Not that running would have helped, but run? I couldn't even dock. I was frozen with fear. It is. It was as if the strength potion had run out, only this time leaving me standing like a statue about to make a of a basketball player about to make a free throw. The dragon had a looked enormous in its leer. Now with its wings outstretched and its talion claws coming straight at me, I knew what enormous really meant. I figured I also knew what about to get her heart ripped out of her chest really meant too. But at the last moment, the dragon pulled up short, landing on the parapet, its feet on two of the merlins right above from where I stood. Standing upright, it breathed a flame out over the courtyard, a warning shot over our heads, we would say in my regular era. But that warning shot had fire licking at the walls of the castle, a good hundred yards away, and the heat was enough to singe my eyebrows. Then, the creature sniffed the air. A moment later, its face was a foot away from my face. I realized the stench of the lair couldn't all be blamed on that ox carcass. The dragon didn't breathe a flame on me. It said in a harsh, sibilant voice, Seven league boots are not impossible to track. Oops. You have broken the covenant I have made with King Cedric. Now I will take back what is mine. Then I will kill you all. Its amber's eyes blink slowly like a lizard, and then it said, but I will eat you first. For once, I was hoping for the fizziness that signified Rasmussen's version of dying. I didn't want to feel a moment of the, that awful heat or those teeth ripping through me. Idiot, I called myself as the dragon caught me up in one talion claw and I suddenly realized what I should have done back in the creature's lair. Dragon, take this ring, I said. Would the compelling spell work with the rid ring hidden from sight beneath my tunic for safekeeping? Apparently not. The dragon continued to bring me toward its mouth, its mouth with its many, many sharp teeth. And I closed my eyes, not wanting to see my own end coming. Three days. I had made it the three days. How many more chances could I possibly get? And then I thought, wait, I don't need another chance. With my eyes still closed, I pluck the crown of bricks, the slayer onto my head and press my free hand against the claw that held me. I could feel the dragon stop moving. I slitted one eye open a crack. Brightness nearly blinded me, and I shut the eye quickly. Sure, the dragon had tricked me. Jack, can you shut that door? And open the other one. Sorry, spooky. Sure, the dragon had tricked me into looking just as it was shooting a flame out of its mouth but I didn't feel anything, heat or fizziness. And now my people were cheering, which I was fairly certain, certain they wouldn't do if I was about to become a flame-boiled chicken nugget. I peeked again. 
It wasn't the fire that was that that was the glint of the sun off gold. I'm sorry. It was that wasn't fire. Fire. That was the glint of the sun off of gold. A lot of gold. The dragon had turned into gold, a victim of my Midas touch. Then began the rescue operation. With grappling hooks and small pikes, my guards were scaling the dragon's body to help get me loose of the golden statue's grip. It took a lot of undignified squirming and leg pulling and calls to suck in my stomach, but finally I popped free. Luckily, Captain Penrod had a good hold on me, or I would have dropped a hundred feet to the ground. I took the crown off and handed it to Grimbold. His men were cheering like crazy. Be careful with this, I warned. He gave a look at the huge golden dragon perched on our battlement and said, you've been doing good. I've been doing lucky, I corrected him. People were coming up and giving me con congratulatory slaps on the arm arms or rub of my head for luck. Kendrick gave me a hug, which was better than anything. Even Adriana had a kind word for me. She said, I never thought I would see you again. I thought of how I had set off with such low expectations of Aldemore, which made me realize, Aldemore, I said. I searched for him in the crowd, but he was right beside me. And he took my arm saying, well done, princess. You were injured, I said, putting his hand to his rear. And he said, mostly indignity. Sir Deming, standing below in the courtyard, cupped his hand to his mouth and yelled, why don't we take the celebration inside where there isn't so much danger of someone taking a flying leap off the battlement? It sounded like fine advice to me. Head for the Great Hall, Deming shouted. So I did, with my people clustering just about as close about me as the ghosts used to do. In the Great Hall, the tables were heaped with all sorts of delicious looking food, including a huge cake shaped like a castle. The smell of roasting meat of fresh peaches or just break, baked bread would have been irresistible even if I wasn't half starved. What's all this? I asked. Your coronation feast, Kendrick told me. He indicated the throne at the head of the room. Presumably they put the second one in storage and I saw a crown waiting for me on its velvet seat. Queen Adriana sidled off to me and said, and you're late. What a surprise. But she didn't have time to waste belittling me, for she got a sight of Grimbold, who somehow or other gotten hold of a satin pillow and was walking around with the pillow on his arm, displaying his newly recovered crown so that he looked like a big hairy ring bearer at a giant's feast. Grimbold, Adriana said with enough enthusiasm to indicate she had been waiting all her life to greet him. She got hold of his arm and looked into his eyes with newly established fascination. As she led him away, I heard her saying, what a lovely crown. You know, my husband never told me about it. I waved to Oriole and Wolfgar across the room, and Oriole waved back, but Wolfgar had his attention captured by Abbas, who was demonstrating one-arm push-ups. Zenas came up to me, but only long enough to say, remember, those are my boots. I wiped my brow with my sleeve and realized how dirty and hot and tired I was. I blew loose the hair that was sticking to my forehead, should I change into something more regal? I asked Kendrick. A three hour soak would have been nice, but I didn't know how much long, long I had. 
Whatever you want. Kendrick handed me a goblet. You do look hot. I really don't like mead, I said. I remembered. It's honey water. It was overly sweet, but at least it was wet. Sister Mary Ursula, wearing the most extravagant and ridiculous dress yet I've seen in this game, said, I am one with happy endings, before the crowd carried her away too. In fact, this crowd was noisy and jostling and was beginning to get on my nerves, making me feel claustrophobic even. Maybe I should sit down, I told Kendrick. I took two steps before my knees completely gave out. Fireworks seemed to be going off behind my eyeballs, the sound exploding inside my skull. Stupid, stupid, stupid. How could I accept a drink from someone who had already poisoned me once in this game? Kendrick knelt down beside me. How could you? I asked, my voice weak and raw whisper. What? He asked. What did I do wrong? Didn't I do everything I was supposed to? I can't go through all this again. You didn't do anything wrong, Kendrick said, which I took to mean that my choices as would-be king were fine with him. Just He just wanted to be king himself more. I don't understand what you're saying wasn't fair. I had lived the entire three days. I saved the kingdoms from the barbarians, the peasants, and a dragon. If there was a next time, ah, I winced against the sparks going off of my brain. I had no idea what to do differently next time, even if there was one. I trusted you. How could you poison me? I didn't, Kendrick said. To my embarrassment, I found that tears were leaking out of my eyes and rolling down the sides of my face. Janine, I did not poison you. Kendrick said, enunciating each word slowly and carefully. If Kendrick hadn't poisoned me, Maybe this wasn't game death. Maybe this was finally the long-anticipated brain overload. That would at least explain the fireworks. I was aware that Kendrick was holding me, cradling my head while the crowd had pulled me back to give me room. I could barely get my mouth to work. I don't know what to do. I said, aware that I sounded as though I had a mouthful of oatmeal. Give my mother the ring, Kendrick said. How did he know about the ring? I saw Adriana hovering with the crowd. I managed to get the piece of twine showing, and Kendrick slipped it over my head. Adriana, take the ring, I mumbled, and Adriana took the ring. Tell her to treat you fairly and not to entice your sons to rebel against you, Kendrick told me. Treat me fairly. I licked my parched lips and Kendrick brushed my hair off my cheek while I got enough energy to finish. And don't entice your sons to rebel against me. While Adriana nodded, Kendrick said, Ask for the crown. Crown? I echoed. Kendrick forced me to sit up a bit more, and Sir Deming placed the crown on my head. Long live King Janine! Deming proclaimed, and the world dissolved in a shower of glitters. Okay, next one is part three and the end and conclusion of our book.